You're listening to This Week in Cardiology from the heart.org, Medscape Cardiology. This podcast is intended for healthcare professionals only. Any views expressed are the presenter's own and do not necessarily reflect the views of WebMD or Medscape. You can now access the latest in medical news on your Amazon Alexa-enabled device. Join me, Perry Wilson, every weekday morning for Medscape Medical Minute, where I highlight the top medical stories of the day. To add Medscape Medical Minute to your flash briefing, search for Medscape Medical Minute on Amazon and click Enable. Or open the Amazon Alexa app, go to Skills, search for Medscape Medical Minute, and click Enable. Then say, Alexa, what's the news? Or, Alexa, what's my flash briefing? I hope you'll join us. Hi, everyone. This is John Mandrola from the heart.org Medscape Cardiology, and this is This Week in Cardiology for January 28th, 2022. This week, AF screening, alcohol in the heart, sports-related sudden death, and non-physician-led care, and CPR. This week, JAMA published the latest USPSTF systematic review on AF screening. Now, this is AF screening by doctors. After a review of 26 studies, the United States Preventative Services Task Force found that the current evidence is insufficient to assess the balance of benefits and harms of screening for AF. Now, USPSTF is a notable group because they are independent experts in critical appraisal. Think neutral Martians, not cardiologists looking at the evidence. The USPSTF assigns grades of preventive services. They use the A, B, C, D, and I system. For example, A grade equals a high certainty of net benefit and doctors should offer or provide this service, while, say, a D grade is high certainty of no net benefit and harms outweighing benefits, and thus doctors should not offer this service. And, of course, I simply means insufficient evidence. My colleague Andrew Foy from Penn State University and I wrote an editorial on this systematic review in JAMA Internal Medicine. And we mostly concurred with the USPSTF group, but emphasized that a major trial published after their review was completed suggested that screening for AFib actually gets closer to a D grade. Well, systematic reviews have to end at some point, and in this case, the USPSTF review ended before publication of the LOOP study, which is arguably the best case scenario for AF screening. I say that because LOOP used implantable LOOP recorders to screen for AF. Now, these are amazing devices. They're always on. They require no action from the person, and it detects AFib with a very decent accuracy. The LOOP trial enrolled older patients and found that the group with the recorder had threefold more AFib discovered and nearly threefold more anticoagulant prescriptions. Yet, yet, all that extra AFib discovered and anticoagulant prescribed did not lead to a statistically significant reduction in stroke. Now, I know some of you will say, come on, Mandrola, in LOOP, the screen group had 20% reduction in stroke. And the majority of the 95% conference interval was actually less than one. Uh, It didn't meet statistical significance, but screening did appear to reduce stroke. Okay, I get that. But the problem is that major bleeding was 26% higher in the screen group. And again, this did not reach significance, but the majority of that 95% conference interval was above one, suggesting a high probability of a higher rate of major bleeding in the screen group. So a wash. Now, comments. So the USPSTF review finds insufficient evidence for AF screening. Loop, with its highest level screening using loop recorders, finds no benefit. Is this surprising? And Foy and I argue no, it is totally expected. Now, for three reasons. The first reason, I think, is that we don't completely understand the relationship between AFib and stroke. And what we wrote in JAM Internal Medicine was this. Consider how AF screening compares with breast cancer screening. The goal of early detection of breast cancer is to reduce the death rate from breast cancer, and because breast cancer is a leading cause of death in women, to reduce the overall mortality. Early detection in AFib is different because AFib is but one cause of stroke. In fact, the majority of the strokes in the patients with a screen-detected AFib may not even be sensitive to anticoagulants. These strokes may be due to vascular disease, for instance. The second reason Foy and I were not surprised by the LOOP trial is that we don't know how much AFib warrants oral anticoagulation. 
In the old days, anticoagulants were proven to have a net benefit, that is, stroke reduction greater than bleeding increase, in patients with, quote, clinical AFib, that is, AFib that prompted a doctor's visit. But now, we have devices that can detect AFib lasting seconds, minutes, and we don't know if treating these short-duration episodes will reduce stroke more than it increases bleeding. Unfortunately, there are two ongoing randomized trials looking at this question. The third reason AF screening could fail is the harms of downstream testing. A person with a smartwatch who discovers an irregular heartbeat may meet a calm, wise doctor who does just the right amount of testing, as well as counseling on reduction of AFib risk factors, such as obesity and alcohol and sleep apnea. And of course, that would be a huge positive. But the asymptomatic, previously healthy person with screen-detected AFib may also meet a doctor who orders a slew of unnecessary tests, any of which could lead to harm. And of course, doing oodles of testing is sometimes warranted, but it nearly always medicalizes a problem. Finally, though, you all probably know the elephant in the room regarding AF screening, and that is that in 2022, AF screening is increasingly being done whether doctors like it or not. The reality is that rhythm monitoring is being done with consumer devices such as watches and smartphone apps. And Foy and I addressed this in our closing. We wrote, we will increasingly see patients present with a surrogate marker of screen-detected AFib. As with any screening test, the question is whether this knowledge can guide management decisions that ultimately improve outcomes. The evidence to date suggests the answer is no. So the biggest lesson, I think, from the USPSTF review is as a thinking exercise about screening for disease, which is admirable in theory, but full up with snags in real life. I think that we really have to strive to help people, our patients, understand the limits of early detection of surrogate markers of disease because the digital revolution is only going to lead to more detection of more dubious surrogate markers of disease. A quick note on COVID vaccine myocarditis. Steve Stiles has excellent news coverage of multiple papers published on vaccine-induced myocarditis, including one from VAERS, Gulp. Do read Steve Stiles. He's always excellent. We don't discuss this topic here because I don't want to lose any more friends. Next topic, alcohol and the heart. The World Heart Federation has published a new policy brief that reports there is no safe amount of alcohol for the heart. Now, the document tries to dispel the notion that a glass of wine per day is beneficial. The authors make the case that these old ideas are based on observational data, which are heavily confounded. I did not find any new sources of data from this document, but I have a couple comments. First is that I think the negative effects of alcohol in the heart are actually underappreciated. So in that sense, I concur with the WHF. I mean, surely people with heart disease or arrhythmias give themselves a better probability of improvement if they cut out alcohol. And I think this is especially true for patients with AFib and or systolic dysfunction and cardiomyopathy. But on the other hand, I also hear my Italian colleague, Dr. Luigi DiBiase, who has told me, Mandrola, how important wine is to the Italian way of life. And I understand that. So it's hard for me to be an anti-alcohol crusader. Cycling is dangerous. Driving a car is dangerous. Skiing is dangerous. Life is full of risks. And as clinicians, we would do well to understand that people may not always make the safest, optimal health decisions. So yes, of course, it is unwise to recommend a glass of wine or spirits for the sake of health. But it's also hard for me to recommend that a healthy, happy person give up their low-dose alcohol intake. Next topic, sports-related sudden cardiac arrest. Jack has published a nice paper from researchers at the University of Paris, first author Nicole Karam, that reports good news on the matter of survival from sports-related cardiac arrest. The authors used data from a French National Institute of Health and Medical Research database, and they were aiming to study the evolution of incidents of pre-hospital management of and survival to hospital discharge of sports-related sudden cardiac arrest among subjects 18 to 75 years over six successive two-year periods going as far back as 2005. 
and they found that the incidence of sudden cardiac arrest in sports was mostly unchanged over the time periods. More on that later. And most sudden cardiac arrest occurs in middle-aged recreational athletes. Now, their big findings were that the frequency of bystander CPR and AED use increased significantly, and this associated with a survival to hospital discharge of 66% in the last time period versus 24% in their first time period. And the authors made two big conclusions. The first conclusion is that the incidence, the incidence of sudden cardiac arrest remained relatively stable over time, and to the researchers, this suggested a need for improvement in screening strategies. However, major improvements in on-field resuscitation led to a threefold increase in survival, and that underlined the value of public education for basic life support, and it should serve as an example for sudden cardiac arrest treatment in general. Now, I agree much more with the latter conclusion about the importance of public education and early intervention. I don't so much agree with the need to improve screening because of the absolute incidence. The incidence of sports-related cardiac arrest is, get this, six to seven per million. Six to seven per million. My friends, I may be wrong, and you can disagree, but I cannot see how any screening techniques could possibly modify an event with an incidence of six per million. The data from this paper suggests the way to save most lives from sports-related cardiac arrest is intervention, not so much prevention. Next topic is physician versus non-physician care. Now, I don't know how it is in your neighborhood, but in ours, more and more care is delivered by nurse practitioners and physician assistants. Mostly, actually, in our area, nurse practitioners. Two years ago, I wrote a column arguing that nurse practitioner and physician assistant care would not, on average, lead to worse outcomes. Nurse practitioners and physician's assistants embraced it, but docs clobbered it. The notion is a counterintuitive notion because doctors have such a longer training program. Well, this past week, I posted a two-year update on this column. I updated it because the growth of non-physician care has been incredible in our area. And I came to the same conclusion that on average, on average, I don't see outcomes being much different. In the post, I gave the reasons why I believe this to be true and then closed with three recommendations that might help ensure confidence in non-physician-led care. I hope you take a look at the column, read it, let me know what you think. Final topic today is about CPR, CPR in the hospital specifically. This is another feature article up on the heart.org Medscape Cardiology, and it's worth taking a look at. It's from interventional cardiologist Jaya Malidi. JM asks a question that I think about often, and that is whether CPR as a default in the hospital is the correct default. She notes that, quote, in this country, we need permission to forego CPR. If there are no advanced directives or next of kin that are available to discuss end-of-life care, performing CPR is the default status for all hospitalized patients, irrespective of the underlying severity of the illness. Now, in her very well-written column, she tells the story of a man who was actively dying but had no next of kin available. CPR, she rightly argues, is an intervention that clearly has little benefit in this person, and then ask why is it the default? This is a really nice discussion about the care of patients who are at end of life. It makes you think about this tough topic that is dying, which is weird because every single one of our patients will die. And remember, friends, hope is not a plan. I suspect that JM's views about inpatient CPR are similar to mine, and you might disagree with me, but I see CPR as an extremely aggressive intervention that has benefits and harms. Now, CPR and early defibrillation is the basis of the coronary care unit. When used in acute MI patients, it is life-saving. I mean, Bernard Laun invented the CCU for this very reason. But far too often, CPR is used in patients with multi-organ failure who have little to no chance of any meaningful survival. And to do CPR in these patients is a tragedy. And to me, one of the most helpful things a cardiology or EP consultant can offer is permission to not recommend or default to CPR. So I congratulate Dr. Malini on such an excellent post, and I recommend it to you all to take a look at on the heart.org Medscape Cardiology website. So that's it for this week in cardiology. As always, I'm grateful that you listened. Thank you. And remember, if you like this podcast, it really helps. Give us a rating. Write us a little review. Make a comment on the website. All these things 
help others find us. Until next week, this is John Mandrola from the heart.org Medscape Cardiology. You're listening to This Week in Cardiology from the heart.org, Medscape Cardiology. This podcast is intended for healthcare professionals only. Any views expressed are the presenter's own and do not necessarily reflect the views of WebMD or Medscape.